Hello, welcome to the Eloni Show. I'm your host, John Maloney. In this episode, don't have regulars because reasons, I guess. As for our guest, he's from Almere, Netherlands. He is a writer and he used to be a professional basketball coach and also have a leadership and meditation group along with his wife called Godpia. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Marco van den Berg Scholten. Excellent. You pronounce that very Britishly. Thank you. So, how's life? Oh, really? Um, wonderful, actually. If you don't uh, get immersed in the news on the world, things going on in the world between nations, uh, and um, uh, limit yourself, uh, limit myself to my inner world, life is very, very nice and very rewarding as of, as of now. Oh, okay. I can say that. And have you been up to much recently? Yes, I've been uh, busy promoting my first novel, um, which is much uh, more work than I'd anticipated it would be. Um, and I'm actually daily writing on a second novel. Um, uh, I do that every morning. Uh, I was actually at it uh, just now. Um, and then uh, I have uh, uh, a 16-year-old daughter um, who... Uh, who requires uh, some answers every now and then. And I also have a wonderful marriage uh, with a wife who travels a lot. So I've, I've been very busy, actually. Very good. Very good. So what is it you mainly do for a living? Well, I, like, I, like, I, I, like uh, you can see in my bio, I was a basketball coach for the last 34 years professionally. And um, uh, I, I own a very small leadership company in Germany um, that uh, every now and then I take uh, uh, some um, uh, small assignments in that regard, uh, mostly individual uh, coaching of, of leaders, uh, every now and then also questions concerning group dynamics. Uh, and the money that I make from those things can still sustain me. Fabulous. Yes. So what, what, was, what was it like being a professional basketball coach? Oh, it was, it was very interesting and a, a learning experience for sure. Because I always wanted to be a player myself. And I never really thought of becoming a, a, a coach um, I studied journalism and then uh, uh, history, um, but I got injured very young. Um, and then my coach asked me to become his assistant coach. This is all during my, my, my study times, my, my period of uh, university. And from that on, I did three years of being his assistant coach in the first league. Uh, I, I was asked to become a basketball coach, which was never in the cards or at least not consciously planned. So I rolled into it, as we say in the Netherlands, and um, I rolled on for 30 years, basically. And, and each, each new season, each new year, uh, I learned something new. And uh, you also, the, the thing that I uh, like most about it is incredibly honest work, because everything you put in or fail to put in your team is immediately represented on the floor. You cannot hide it. You cannot make excuses. So it's it's like a mirror of your own development, so to speak. This is the most um, the most rewarding part of the job. When I look back on it now, now that I haven't done it since 2021, not the championships or the international basketball coaching that I was that I could do, or you know, even being a national team coach, which is of course a great honor. For me personally, the, 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 the fact that you, with every new team, with every new relationship with players, you get something back that's valuable in your life. I think that was the, the main part. What's not nice about it is that you're being judged by people who don't know anything about it, the intrinsic process of team development. Usually they don't know very much about the technicalities of the game. But what's, what's really annoying is when people start to interfere from a power position 
and and they they mess up the group process. This happens quite a bit in pro sports, unfortunately. Uh, yes, I can see that. So, how did God Pierre got started? Go deeper. Go deeper. Uh, All right. Go deeper is is actually um, a spin off from a, a a a company I had in the Netherlands, which was named after after Pericles, the old Greek philo- uh, Greek leader in the fifth century BC. Um, I I was asked as a in my capacity as a as a basketball coach to to project uh, pro sports models on non sports models. I was just asked. I, I didn't apply for it. I did not. Um, uh, I did not seek these situations. I was just asked. And, and from that, I started a small company when I was still working only in the Netherlands. And this was Pericles. And this is the company that doesn't exist anymore. It's now Godipa. And then I moved to Germany and I have a German wife. And uh, the same thing happened. So we had to start something uh, similar uh, in, in, in uh, you know, our eastern neighbor, so to speak. And it's called Godipa because uh, we believe that What's really going on in teams is always below the surface. And the word go deeper is, is actually nicked uh, in English from a very famous Tibetan monk, uh, Mingyur Rinpoche, who always says, you have to go deeper, you have to go deeper. And uh, we thought, we both, my wife and I both thought that was funny. So we, 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 you know, we chose that moniker for our, for our firm. And she's a, she's a politician. Uh, but she also likes to do mediation. It, also in her p- political work, she's really good at bringing um, different opinions together in a consensus. So her part of it is uh, uh, the mediation. When whenever there's a, a challenge for a mediating mediation, she's she's being asked if she has time because politicians don't have that much time. And I am really basically for two things: leadership coaching, individual leadership coaching, and group dynamics. So those are basically also the my only two levels of, of expertise. And, and I say that with great humbleness because my expertise is really limited um, to uh, the area of, of what happens in competitive sports teams. Okay. Interesting. Yes, it's, that is very interesting, actually. Yeah, very nice. And about your novels... How many mm. have you written or in the process of writing so far? I've written one, um, and it took me 33 years. So, you know, I'm 58 now, so maybe there's one more if I live long enough. Um, no, I, 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 um, when I was still studying, I, I was on the threshold of becoming a professional coach, and then I was one, but not necessarily for a life. I always thought journalism is a great stepping stone for maybe writing novels later. So that was always in me. And this novel that has just come out, it's called In Search of Achilles, was synopsis-wise already done in 1990. So that's a long time ago. And it's actually set, of course, if you write a synopsis in 1990, if you want to have a realistic novel, which is what I want, uh, uh, it cannot be set anywhere else, really. Anyway... Um, but then the the business of being a professional basketball coach interfered with be becoming a, a novelist because you cannot combine those two. It's impossible. I tried it at the very beginning, and and these 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 threads of narration just intertwined in such a way that I I, I couldn't clearly lead a team. Neither could I have a fresh mind to get uh, any words on paper. So I ditched it. Until 2005, when I took a sabbatical from my work as a basketball coach. And then I tried to write this novel in my mother tongue, which is the Dutch language. Uh, I had saved money to, to be able to do it. So, but after half, about half a year, about six months of writing, I looked at my, what I did and I just didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't think it was good enough. So I ditched that again, uh, having known I at least tried it. Uh, and then I went back to coaching, but strangely, the the novel kind of stuck around in the back of my mind. And then in 2021, I suddenly had a paid vacation because I had a conflict with the last club I worked for. But they, I was still on the contract for a year and a half. And then I started writing this novel, this very novel, in American English, which which had been my stepmother's tongue for 30 years by now uh, in, in in professional basketball 
the lingua franca is really American English because of the the heritage of the of the sport. Um, and from the first moment on, I liked the tone that I got on paper. And then uh, in about six months, so we're talking June, maybe July 2022, I finished the first version and I immediately wrote the second version. And that took me about two months, two and a half. And then I thought, well, this is actually good enough to be published. And I started sending it to the United States because it's in, written in American English uh, and to try to get a publisher on board, which took a while. But then after a while, there was one publisher. It's in, they call that an indie publisher. I didn't know all that when I went through the business. Uh, and they said, okay, let's, let's do it. And then it takes another year before it's on the market. But now it's been on the market for three weeks, three and a half weeks. Fabulous. Yes, that's that's very. The fact that 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 it finally gives birth, so to speak, when it just keeps hanging in your head, uh, into a book that you can hold and look and 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 see, that is a, that's again a very rewarding experience. So it got me hooked. So now I'm writing a second one. Very nice. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Um, I would go on an Alp at about 1500 meters. So the small Alpine village would be like 500 meters below where there's one grocery store, maybe a, maybe a butcher, maybe a bakery, uh, where, uh, in the winter you have a little bit of skiing enough for dilettantes to come, but not like a hosh posh ski resort in your area. And in the summer, you have the clean air and the great view. So I, I would love to live on an Alp in a very basic um, wooden hut that has everything you need, but no excess. So you have running water, you have uh, normal um, bathroom and showering opportunities. You have maybe a wooden stove to keep you warm. You can cook. You can you can get clean water really nearby. But that's about it. That's that's that would be my ideal environment to live in. Fabulous, fantastic. Yeah, you like that. Yes, very good. If you were given five hundred acres of land, what mm -hmm. would you use it for? Um. I would probably um, invite my mother to come live with me f to grow a vegetable garden, give her also a, a little place for herself. I would, I would build, again, this hut <laughs> that I just mentioned for me and my wife and my daughter to visit and my brother and his family to visit and friends. And f other than that, I would let nature run its course. Wu uh, Wai, uh, as the Chinese say. So I, I would hope... Some beautiful trees would grow on it, uh, uh, different kinds. I would let a stream run through it if, if, that, if that would happen. I would, I would take care of the soil in that sense that I wouldn't let it, you know, grow into a, a paradise for weeds. But at the same time, I wouldn't over-cultivate it. I would cultivate the part that I need for my vegetables and maybe my potatoes uh, and maybe, you know... Uh, my mother is very um, creative when it comes to tending to her garden. Uh, there will probably at some point be, will be a small greenhouse in it with, with which would grow, uh, I don't know, maybe some tropical fruits. I don't know, but she, she, she's very creative. But it, it would be only a small part. The biggest part of the land, I would allow nature to reclaim it, which is what we should do, what we all should do. Nice. That's great. Yes. Can, have you, do you have any uh, tips for me to get that kind of life? Hmm. Not all I can think of, but what is important is always find whatever land you can and make the best of it. Because, well, during these times, during these days, not, not many, there's not much many open land available. It's all being used up for construction of houses and real estate or whatnot so uh yeah and monocultural agriculture we in, we in the netherlands have way too much of that which which is really bad for the soil and it, the earth doesn't regenerate by the way you're british 
And yes. uh, one of the areas, if I can't find the Alp, that I would probably take my second pick is to get a little house on Exmoor in the West Country. Uh, I think that's one of the most beautiful areas to visit in the world. Well, I haven't seen everything of the world, but what I have seen, and I keep coming back to Exmoor again and again. It's, it's just so unspoiled. It's just so wonderful. And if I could get a plot of land there, I think I also would be very happy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very fabulous. Yes. If your life was a meal, what kind of meal would it be? A meal? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, there'd definitely be very good wine with the meal. Um, it would be a little bit of hedonic in the sense that the, 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 the stew would be well cooked and uh, with a sprinkle of grandmother over it. So maybe an Italian meal, a traditional Italian farmer's meal. Not a posh meal like you, you would get in Lyon or in the Michelin restaurants. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's that's not really what what translates my life correctly. It's is more, um, you know, what what does the season have to offer on the farm, and then make something beautiful out of it in a very primal way, uh, but at the same time in a very natural way, and then uh, use it uh, to connect family, friends, uh, celebrate the joy of life. I think that's, that's, that would be a kind of pretty good description. Fantastic. And music. There, had to, there, there would be music. I, I would have a, a cantatore, Italian cantatore present uh, to sing songs and then take a bite and then sing another song and then take requests when everybody has had enough wine. And, and, and he'd, he'd have some, you know, a, a pianist with him and a guitar player and maybe... A, a warm player, yeah, something like that. Yeah, very good. Yeah. What's the best way to travel? By train. Yes. No doubt. About it. No doubt. Abs about it. Absolutely. Yeah. What is your favorite quote? Um. Okay. I would have to go to China for that. Um. And there's a couple of them in the Lao Tse. And the one that I would like to use is this one, 81. I have it in front of me now. And it says, truthful words are not beautiful. Beautiful words are not truthful. And because I'm trying to write a novel that interests people who read it, I find this to be a great guideline. There's, of course, way more depth behind it. But uh, so the, 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 the thing that I really admire about this quote is it's very practical on a simple, rational level. And at the same time, it's incredibly, incredibly deep. So beyond the rational level, which is what a good book should be. At the same time, um, I believe good writing, this is just my opinion, this is my taste, really, should be as as far away from showing off uh, erud being erudish, having, having great knowledge, uh, having an incredible vo vocabulary, it should be f as far away from that as possible. And it should cut to the core. This is the style that I like the best. So that's why this, this quote from Lao Tse is, is, is something that really resonates with me. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself 20 years from now? I'd be 78 uh, on that Alp with my wife, probably with a really nice dog, and, and hopefully my daughter visiting every now and then. Maybe even with that plot of land that you gave me. I mean, you, <laughs> you're really begin you, you, you sparked my imagination with that. Um, and hopefully looking uh, at a better world when I look out. But, but I would like to retire. I would never want to retire. But, uh, you know, slowly fade into the sunset 
in that kind of an environment, very natural, very clean, uh, with the ability to be on your own, at the same time still be connected. Not in a city, for sure. And I hope I have at least written one or two more interesting novels. Not that I necessarily have ambition to be like a big star. Actually, I don't have that ambition at all. But I want to write deep, serious literature. And, and if, I, if, if I have been able to uh, find the source for that as, as it is available to me, to my life, to my abilities or lack of those, then I think I would be, feel very rewarded. At the same time, I would want my marriage to still be harmonious. Yes. Yes. Very good. What could you give a 40-minute presentation on without any preparation? Oh, I would say uh, group dynamics, in, especially with the connection to sports. Um, I'm very interested in the, in the, the crossing of philosophical schools of the world. They call that comparative philosophy. So trying to connect, let's say, our culture, the Western culture, which in English they call the Occident, with, for example, uh, the Chinese culture, maybe the Japanese culture, they are connected. Um, this is a, 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 a topic that I've been studying since university. And I was really, in the 1990s, I was one of the very few students who took um, classes in sinology. Um, and... Um, I think I could, I, could, I could at least speak about my perspective on the different w roads that these traditions have gone uh, without preparation. I, I don't know if I could be really academically cohesive, but I'm not really a truly academic thinker in that sense. But I definitely could... Um, uh, could do that. Then, of course, any topic that has to do with the technical or tactical side of basketball, I could go on and on. I mean, just give me, give me a small bone, and I'll make a whole meal. Um, I think those are the main things. I I I, I love to talk about literature, uh, but I'm not sure if I'm a, a scholarly level. But uh, that definitely interests me. But certainly the 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 group dynamics in, in professional sports teams where winning is the goal um, and also co some topics from comparative philosophy, for sure, those two. That's actually, that's a very good presentation. That would be very useful. <laughs> yes, well, you're recording it, so if, if, if you throw it out to the world, make sure that people can cut this part out. Who knows? They might, you know, order Godipa for an assignment, whoever, whatever, you know, you never yeah. know. Yeah, absolutely. What is your favorite holiday tradition? Hmm. I would say hiking. Yeah, hmm. hiking and if possible with dogs. Take long walks. That's where one of the beautiful things about Exmoor, actually also about Dartmoor, is you can just go outside if you stay in a village and within, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, you're you're on the wild land that is unspoiled in the sense that nobody is allowed to do any industrial uh, work on it. And it's, and then it, it's the way nature is there. And then just roam the lands together with your animals and, and whatever the weather is, you're really, really in nature. I think this is what I like the most. Um, I like that even better than, you know, taking in sights, which is also interesting. There's so much culture, of course, to be seen, to, to be learned from. But I believe the, the hiking part is probably my favorite. Yeah, I would say so. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah my second book, by the way, the first book is really more on an individual's perspective uh, in his search for values. Uh, you could actually say maybe that it's kind of like a search to battle the loneliness he feels in his culture now. Second book is more about freedom, and I actually located it in an area that's very similar to Exmoor and the West Coast, beaches, um, because that area has always inspired me. So as we speak, I was just writing a piece of paper in my typewriter, uh, half a meter away from where I'm sitting now, um, I was actually in that world mentally, so 
Yeah. Sweet. What is the best way to start the morning? Uh, well, I do. Uh, I call my wife when we're not together. Uh, and then I do some Tai Chi outdoors. Um, we're very lucky here in the Netherlands where we live. We have a terrace on the water. And you always have the fresh air, basically, and the beautiful sunrise. Always different colors. They're, every day is different. Um, and because I've always had an um, active job being a coach, now that I'm sitting a lot more, you know, the blubber is coming quick. So I need to find ways to, um, to keep moving with that more sedentary style. So I wake up. I take in the fresh air and do a couple of Tai Chi things. Nothing special, but it still gets me started. And then absolutely the old black gold uh, with a little bit of cow's milk. The coffee is... Uh, I, I cannot do without the coffee. Ah, yes, the coffee. And then I usually uh, listen to cl the British version of Classic FM to get me started. Ah, yeah. That's Very nice. Nice. And then I sit down because I always write. Like I said, I write in the morning because you, you still have connected to your subconscious. And I believe writing is, in the end, a subconscious activity or at least um, crossing the pathway of the subconscious with the conscious. Uh, and I find that, that my uh, the sentences and the words that visit me are the freshest. So that, that's basically my morning. I don't eat until... 10.30, and I've done a lot of writing by then already. Ah, uh, all right then. What takes a lot of time to master, but it is definitely worth it? Um, letting go, non-grasping. Yep. The human predicament, non-grasping. Merge with the dust. Be understanding life more deeply. And with understanding, I, I mean the non-grasping. So not naming it, which is crap, but actually unnaming it. The Chinese call that merge with the dust. I believe that's extremely important for each life. And, and everybody finds his road in his own individual manner. But it doesn't happen completely if you don't learn to let go of the grasping part. Yes. It's with, with great sports, for example. You need to, let's say my sport, basketball. And I actually also play tennis, but that's, that's not at the same level. You need to master the techniques. And your body needs to become one with the techniques. But after that, the, the true way of playing, because it's such a creative game with, with constantly changing environmental obstacles, is with a totally open mind a flexible mind where you can just very quickly respond uh, intuitively and naturally. And this is the letting go part. If you say, I must dribble like this, pass then, like a robot, you're actually not playing the game. The learning part, the fundamental part, the learning of the, of the right toolbox for yourself is absolutely a rep rep repetitive process. But you only become really good if you can actually transcend the, the logical element of it. If you, can, if you can incorporate your whole being with your techniques into being totally open to every new situation. That's the letting go part. And the really great players like Michael Jordan, obviously the best player ever. But they were always able to create something new out of complicated situations without being... Um, without anybody having been where they went be, or there before. I mean, that's pure creativity. And this doesn't happen, this is my experience, without the ability to let go of anything that you're clamping onto, for whatever reason. Absolutely. And that is all we have for this episode. It's great having you on, Marco. Talking about being a writer, working as a professional basketball player, and... Go deep here, of course, and everything else has been great. Yes, you liked it. Yes, it's brilliant. Wonderful. How, how can people uh, hear this? Well, where is, it, where is it broadcasted? So the podcast could be, could be listened on to any major platform where you can listen to podcasts, such as 
Spotify, Amazon Music. What else? Oh, wonderful. Uh, so if you if you because I'm really non digital, if you if you send me the link of the podcast, if you're going to air it, that is, yeah, I can yeah. send it to my friends and, and, and acquaintances via email or whichever way, and then they can listen to it. Yes, exactly. From whatever platform you can listen to, on, on any podcast onto. Wonderful. And and when do you think you will air this one? Well, with a lot of episodes, it will take like a few months, perhaps, because I had so many guests and there's so much PQ. It will, it will certainly take a few months, maybe okay. two or three months, perhaps. But other than that, once the episode does come out, I will share it. You can, I will send you the link and share it with whoever you like. Oh, wonderful. You've been so kind. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And with that being said, until next time, stay tuned for more.